Welcome to the Online Great Books Podcast, brought to you by OnlineGreatBooks.com, where we talk about the good life, the great books, great conversation, and great ideas. Hello, dear listener. This is Brett, the producer of the Online Great Books Podcast. Welcome back to the show This week and next, Scott and Carl will explore Joel Salatin's 2021 book, Polyface Micro. Subtitle of the book, Success with Livestock on a Homestead Scale. Many of you might hear that and say, okay, this subject matter is not for me. I think there's something here for everyone. Salatin does a really fine job scaling his principles down all the way to a city apartment. And you might push back further and say, my apartment building does not allow livestock. Check your lease. I'm sure there's nothing in there about livestock, as a matter of fact. Either way, I think that everybody can find something to take away from this book. And spring is here. And more broadly speaking, the season is here to get serious about food autonomy. So you might just find some inspiration here. And Scott and Carl will also personalize much of the subject matter of this book on two different scales, so you might find that interesting as well. Come back next week, please, for part two. As always, thank you for your time and attention, and we'll get right to it. I'm Scott Hamburg. I'm Carl Shoot. Good morning, Carl. Good morning, Scott. It's it's early in the morning. Yeah, it's early for early for recording. It's not early for other things. But it's early to record yeah. something that other people are going to listen to. I need to turn up my dial or I'm going to seem even less excited than I usually do. What dial? So what are we reading today? Joel Salatin's newest book, Polyface Micro, Success with Livestock on a Homestead Scale. Yeah, we'll talk about this. It's going to be hard for me to talk about this because I just finished another of his books, Pastured Poultry Profits. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh-huh. and it's going to be hard for me to separate in my brain where I read what, you know? I have the Salad Bar Beef book if you need to borrow it. Mm. Isn't that one that everyone should own? Shouldn't I have my own copy of that? You should, I, but I'm just being kind and offering you. Well, thank you. I'm not sure if I'm going to have beef. I'm going to try. So today is going to be the Salatin book, and of course we'll do this in two parts, and then after that we're going to do... Did you agree with this list in Slack, Carl, we talked about, maybe? Yeah. Uh, Robert Hutchins. Yeah, we're going to do Hutchins, and then I'm not a... The the John Dewey (laughs) challenge, I'll I'll, I'll struggle through. Oh, well, me too. And then, and then, dear listener, the Silmarillion. Yeah. Which is, again, I just got my copy... It's a book I think – I don't think Scott will be indifferent to it. I think he will either <laughs> love it or he's going to say, why would you have me read this crap? I'm getting more and more like that. Like I, I've always kind of been that way and I'm getting more that way. Mm. Uh, but but for the listener, we're going to read Robert Hutchins' essay, The Great Conversation. It's in the first volume of The Great Books of the Western World set by Encyclopedia Britannica. You can find it out there as a PDF on the interwebs. And then uh, John Dewey's essay, uh, Challenge to Liberal Thought from the book, the later works, 1925 to 1953, volume 25 of uh, Dewey's horrific thought. So you can go find that thing. And and, uh, the uh, the Great Conversations, I don't know, 50 pages. Uh, The Dewey piece is... 15 pages, something like that. Y'all can read along. And if you want to, the Silmarillion is not short. Uh, It wasn't really intended for publication. It's, well, maybe it was, but not for a long time. It's the, the world building for Lord of the Rings. It's got stuff that's good in its own right. It's a little bit weird. Uh, Tolkien was a weird guy. Yeah. I started reading that thing last night. Yeah? Yeah. I'll save it. Dare I say thoughts? Oh, I, I just started it. I went ahead and read that letter from uh, Tolkien to his editor, and that's all I've read so far, which is inter- interesting. You know, we don't always get to see the author's intent. There was a discussion in our Telegram chat, Carl, 
Go to t.me slash scottstream if you went in on all the edgelord talk at the Telegram about authorial intent and like critical theory. And, and uh, there are folks, you know, that quoted, I think it was Hemingway. He said, you know, the, the fish is a fish. The old man is an old man. Uh, I'm just reading it. Hey, after we read the Silverillion, yeah. you know what I was thinking about? No. You said a children's book, and I think that would be good. But I was thinking, you know, we ought to read like the, uh, was it Howard Pyle, Robin Hood? Or, I had those when I was a kid. Or maybe Lamort Darthur? Uh-huh. Yeah, one of those. Because that's some more Darthur, English yeah. uh, myth that Tolkien found wanting, you know? Well, because it's French. Well, shh. Is Robin Hood French? Come on. No, Robin Hood's not French, but mm -mm. The, the King Arthur stuff is. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, one of those might be good. We also threw out some other things like uh, Klaus Witz. <laughs> this is before we knew we were at war, by the way. Gibbon, uh, which, you know, I want to finish reading the Shelby Foote thing. And I mm. also want to read all of Gibbon, you know, so maybe we can find a way to. <laughs> well, that's a big task. <laughs> well, I'm here to play, man. Come on. So, Joel Salatin, who is he? Oh, you're asking me? I'm asking you so you can tell the audience. This is exposition. He is the lunatic farmer with the engineer's heart from, uh, I think it's Swoop or Swope, Virginia. His dad was a pretty sharp guy, and they bought, his dad bought a big ranch. I think it was in Venezuela. And uh, the government essentially, they, they ended up fleeing there, uh, fleeing Venezuela. And um, came back to the United States, and his dad bought this property in, in Virginia where they started kind of hobby farming, maybe. And uh, he's been he's been working on that on that land since I think sixty one. When he was eight, he got his first animals. He's still there now. He was born in fifty seven. So uh, what does that make him? Sixty sixty five years old. He is sort of in the vanguard maybe of the uh, regenerative agriculture movement here in the United States to kind of give people an idea of, of just how he be. He's super thrifty. He makes almost everything they use from scratch and uh, he leaves nothing undone. So he will, he, he grazes a thousand head of cattle, moves them once or twice a day, three or four days later, he moves thousands of laying hens onto the same paddock that the chickens that the beef were on so that the chickens can eat the fly larva in the poop and scratch that all in real good and then he'll follow that up with turkeys and then sometimes he'll follow that up with pigs because he wants everything turned to protein and uh he's super super efficient in the homesteading world there there are all sorts of folks out there this is one of the best things that you can use youtube for i think is to watch these people who are growing stuff on their land, who are making use of their land and, and figuring out what they can do with it. But there are a lot of small-scale people. So Justin Rhodes is on 10 acres, and, you know, there's people on 3 acres, and, and, you know, there's gardening channels, and you can see all this stuff that people have done. Well, there's a few people that are doing it on a large scale, and uh, Salatin's one of them, and Greg Judy's another one, uh, that are, are showing you that you can get a lot of food out of the land. I was thinking about this. So in the news, <clears throat> dear listener, you may have noticed that there is, as of our writing, there is war in Europe, or as of our recording. Not that again. Yeah, that old thing. But it's just some noblemen and their retinue, like, doing hand-to-hand, -hand, right? It doesn't have anything to do with us, right? I mean, we can just tend our stuff. <laughs> There's lots of oil. Over there, there's lots of wheat over there. There's lots of fertilizer hmm. that we import from over there. So uh, I, I'm not sure that we can ignore it. Well, there's nothing we can do about it. But the, the problem is when you have all these inputs from foreign sources, the food that you are eating depends on a whole lot of other inputs. What if those inputs get cut off? Hmm. If. Yeah, he he grows things with no inputs. He has a thousand head of cattle. I, he raises, I don't know, five digits of broiler chickens a year. I mean, 
in excess of 10,000 broiler chickens a year. Uh, he creates, I don't know, a thousand dozen eggs a week, something like that. I mean, great big numbers. No veterinary mm-hmm. bills, no nitrogen. Right, right. That's important. So the old time, the old timey structure of the farm is kind of what he is recovering. Where you had, you had cows, and you had pigs, and you had chickens, and you had those three for a reason. Yeah. Because they supply you with everything you need to grow the cows, the pigs, and the chickens. You get the compost from the animals and put it on your field. It's the way things used to be. It might be the way things have to be in the future if world supplies get disrupted and, you know, fertilizer goes up uh, uh, 20,000% or something, you know. Or or how about this? 200%. Yeah, and... You can't grow corn without that stuff. Should I tell my chicken poop story? Sure. I love stories about chicken poop. Uh, Yeah. You know, like all the hot fencing talk from our last show. If there are any listeners that don't enjoy this, just go find another fucking show. Go listen to the Hillsdale College one. They'll they'll just drone on. You can go get all that mediocre stuff. Or, no, 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 no. This is what you should do, dear listener. You should think, hmm, it is possible that there are things that I'm not interested in in which I should be interested. Carl's so generous. And chicken poop, chicken poop might be one of those things. Yeah, I think it should be. I have a good friend, a guy who's, he's a neighbor man, and he's become a good friend who gives me wood chips, and I have probably, I don't really know, 100,000 pounds of wood chips, something like that. I've used them to mulch all my fruit trees and nut trees, and I have a lot of those, and Actually, I've used that much already, but that this is just piled up. And to get compost to work, I would like to compost this. Compost is different than just rotting. Rotting can be um, fungal and uh, doesn't really create soil in the same way. Anyway, I want it to be compost. And so for it to be compost, you really need about 30 parts carbon to one part nitrogen. Well, the wood chips are about 500 parts carbon to one part nitrogen. So I need a whole bunch of nitrogen, like a lot. And when I was a kid, you used to be able to go around here. This north, Northeast Oklahoma, Northwest Arkansas is Tyson chicken country. You used to be able to go to the chicken farm, and that farmer would just load you up and be glad that you took that stuff, that chicken poop, out of there. So I started calling around, and from what I have come to understand, Arkansas and Oklahoma have changed their laws so that you can't really clean out your own chicken house. Now, I think this is actually ultimately a good move. You have to be a licensed contractor to do this, and the reason they license these contractors is because they don't want that poop to end up in our watersheds. Uh, We have some beautiful creeks and rivers around here that had become not so beautiful, had become algae-ridden, and the temperature in the water had risen, and so on, because of all the nitrogen in it from all the chicken runoff. So this has put a stop to this, and I've seen it myself in the creeks that we, in swimming holes that we go to. Anyway, so I start calling some of these litter removal people. They call it chicken litter. They don't call it poop. And nobody has any chicken poop. And I say, well, why not? I said, well, you know, propane prices have almost doubled this winter, and most of the chicken producers are leaving the litter in the chicken houses because when it decomposes, it makes heat, and it reduces their propane heating bill. Now, goodness, when it does that, when it decomposes, it's making ammonia and other noxious problems that affect the health of the bird, but, you know, everything's a compromise, right? So they're trying to keep the heat in the chicken house this winter. One of the gentlemen I talked to, he said he had equipment to operate 11 litter removal crews. So this would be like uh, skid steer loaders, dump trailers for semi trucks, disinfecting equipment, so on. He said he had equipment for 11 of these crews. He only had men to run two of them. He said, so these farmers, he says, these chicken, these operators, he don't call them farmers. He said, these operators are going to call me. They're going to want their places cleaned out. And he said, I I just can't get to it. I mean, there's only, you know, two out of my 11 crews running. It's going to be a while. 
Mm-hmm. And he said, but I'll put you on the waiting list. If you want some poop, I'll put you on the waiting list. And, and I said, well, I want, you know, 50 tons, 25 to 50 tons. Mm-hmm. He said, and one of the guys said, oh, well, there's a, I'll put you on the list. He said, I could probably work you in with a small order like that. I said, small order, what's your average order? He said, oh, 10,000 tons. He had 100,000 wow. tons on his list ahead of me. Then I said, uh, by the way, if you're going to put me on the list, what's this going to cost me? He said, oh, it's running about $40 a ton. And I said, well, I don't think that's actually the price. If I, if, if I call you and want some and, and you tell me that it's $40 a ton and I get my checkbook out and then you tell me you don't have any, that's not really what the price is, is it? And he laughed. And I said, how much of it would show up if I paid $150 a ton? <laughs> and he said, well, you'd probably get some no more. Well, then we talk on a little bit. And he said he had 100,000 tons on his waiting list. 100,000 tons on his waiting list. And the reason he's quoting $40 is because his average order is much larger. And he's selling this to row crop farmers and the demand for chicken poop. So not only is he not able, not only is one, the chicken producer, not releasing the litter because of the heat and propane cost issue. And two, does he not have the labor problem? Three, nitrogen fertilizer has Why does he have the labor problem? It's not clear to me. A lot of the gimmies are gone, you know, that caused the labor problems of 2020 and 2021. I really don't know why. It seems like if you've got a, you know, a chauffeur's license, can drive a semi-truck that, I mean, he'd put your ass to work tomorrow. And it'd be short-haul stuff. It wouldn't be overnight, over-the-road stuff. You'd be home every evening. It seems like it'd be a pretty good job. And the guy driving the truck's not in the chicken house, you know, breathing chicken litter. Uh, I don't know why. It doesn't make sense to me. Well, some of it does. Yeah, well, we had incentives for people not to work in the last two years. And what you get from the story is that there are lots of inputs into making the food that you eat, and all of them are stressed. All of them are stressed. Uh, all of them are stressed. So uh, there's one more chunk I hadn't gotten food to. food cost is high now, I'm sorry, I'll be quiet and let you finish. Yeah, the one more chunk I hadn't gotten to is he has a, not only can they not get the litter, the demand for it has gone way up because nitrogen fertilizer has almost doubled in price. These row crop farmers can't afford to buy the nitrogen. They can't do it. So they're trying to get the chicken poop. Well, come to find out they can't even buy it at any price. So things are getting bad. Yeah, and so what happens to the corn crop if you can't get nitrogen fertilizer? The price is going to go well, up. Well, and the the supply is going to go down because people aren't going to farm it because they can't make any money off of it. Yeah. To uh, to, to the Austrian economist, that's what I said. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. Anyway, so, so... I don't know. To the Austrian economist? <laughs> that's right. Price goes up means that the supply had to have gone down or the, or the, or the demand went up. But... Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm a literary guy. I'm not an economics guy. Yeah. You have to walk me through this stuff. But why do I care if the corn price goes up? I don't eat corn. Everything eats corn. Yeah, so all of your beef eats corn. Your cooking oil is corn if it's not soy. Food prices going up seems like it's going to happen. The nitrogen fertilizer comes from, isn't it petroleum byproducts? They have to burn a lot of natural gas to fix that nitrogen in those, nod- in those pellets, nodules. Right. So if oil prices go up, fertilizer prices go up. And if our current farming relies on pouring nitrogen into the ground, you can see that this is an unsustainable thing. We talked about this with the Schumacher book a while back. So where's your food going to come from? Maybe I'm tinfoil hat crazy and and everything will just magically be okay like it has for the last hundred years. But through most of human history, through most of human history, there's famines. Yep. They're big events. There haven't been for the last hundred years because we've been pouring nitrogen onto the fields. So reason to say that is a book like this, 
polyface micro and p- things that people like Joel Salatin are doing is stuff that you might have to do. It might not just be a hobby for weird potato pilled people. Okay. It might be something that you have to do or you're not going to get chicken eggs what? or you're not going to get meat and you'll have to eat crickets because <laughs> that's all that they'll be. And you'll enjoy it. Not me, brother. I don't well, want to eat well you know what? Even that cricket thing is rubbish. It's like that, gotta be farmed on something. They gotta eat something. You know, so you want you want the most efficient way to turn that nitrogen into protein. I mean, I think I think Salatin has done that. Uh, I don't know how big his farm is. You know, Greg Judy will tell you he has a sixteen hundred and twenty acres the last time I knew. And he, and he'll tell you how, how many beef cattle he produces in a year and all that. I think Salatin's is actually a little smaller than that. I know that he owns, I don't know this, I believe that he owns around four or 500 acres, then at least his additional farmland around him. I'm sure he's been acquiring land when he could. And a lot of his farmland has timber on it. He's running a thousand head of cattle on probably something like a thousand acres, in addition to all the chickens and pigs and rabbits that they produce on there. He is very efficient at turning nitrogen into protein. Um, And then when you realize that he's not getting nitrogen from off of the farm, what he's doing is absolutely miraculous. Yeah. You're not going to get crickets as environmentally cheaply as Salatin gets you grass-fed beef. No. No. And and the the, the point about the understanding a little bit about how modern agriculture works is it will disabuse you of the notion that if only we don't eat meat, everything will be fine. It's garbage. If you don't eat meat, you don't have the critters on your farm that are producing the manure that lets you compost, that lets you grow the grain. Not to mention a monoculture, how many critters get killed when you plow up that field every year for a monoculture corn or wheat farm trillions of worms and everything yeah. and mice and, and it, it, you're not you're not being friendly to the animal vegetarians yeah. if you want to be a vegetarian for taste reasons fine if you want to be a vegetarian for ethical reasons i'll say it you're being stupid yeah you're not even accomplishing what you think you're accomplishing yeah. unless you're growing all your own veggies and only eating them you're contributing to the death of animals every time you open your mouth and chew. So get over it. Realize that you're going to have to kill other beings in order to eat. And then you can figure out how to do it in a good way, in a way that honors the pigness of the pig, for example. Yeah, that's what he says. And realize that that there's a cycle there and you're part of it. And just frustrating to me. Salatin is a, he was a newspaper man. He wrote for, well, I don't remember. He wrote for a a small newspaper for a number of years before he was able to quit his off the farm job and go do this full time. So he fancies himself a writer among other things. I say fancies himself. That's not fair. He is among a a writer among (laughs) other things. And he's written so many, many books and, um, One of the bad things about Polyface Micro, the book, is that it doesn't tell, you don't get enough of his philosophy. This book is for people that already understand what he does and and want to do it themselves. uh, He's got a book on Polyface Designs, which is about all the equipment that he has designed to run on his property. Uh, Salad Bar Beef is one about poultry farming. Um... He's got one called Everything I Want to Do is Illegal, War Stories from the Local Food Front, uh, Family Friendly Farming, on and on and on. He's written, I don't know, he's probably written 20 books. His views on agriculture are probably spelled out better in some of those or in all of those taken on whole than they are in this book here. He wants the homesteader to have diversity, biological diversity on their plot even if that's a, uh, a Manhattan apartment. He advocates running chickens and rabbits in Manhattan apartments in this book. Yeah. They're not going to do it, but they could. Yep. And he tells them how to, in, how they could do it. 
So I know you're out there, probably not too many in our audience, but the shop local folks, the, the, uh, you're worried about your carbon footprint. Okay. (laughs) Good. How much did it take to get those eggs in your refrigerator? A lot. Because, you know, if you live in the middle of Manhattan, there's no farms. The last farm in, gosh, Cook County had their last agricultural state fair or county fair in 1923, I think. Wow. Because there's just nobody doing, hardly anybody doing farming in Cook County anymore. So all your food is being trucked in. Well, trucks run on what? Diesel. Yeah. So you're having your food shipped in so that you don't have to see how it's made, which is part of the problem. So you think that that meat and eggs and butter and milk and all of these things that you eat, even your almond milk, you think that all of this stuff just kind of leaps to your shelf. No, it's got to be farmed. And the further away it is, the more carbon it takes to get it to you. So maybe you ought to raise a chicken or two in your apartment in Manhattan. And you could, if the laws would allow it. And if you can't do that, you could probably do rabbits. And make some of your own food. You know, you could release some of the pressure on this supply chain. In the future, I think it's going to have to happen. Ten years from now, I think it's going to have to happen. Mm -hmm. You might as well get started. Let's go. Yeah. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe everything will magically be good. But uh, the book's all right. I I, I could have helped him edit it. It could have used a little more structure. Sure. And it's all right. I, I feel like he sat down with a with a microphone and talked it into his computer. Probably. Which is fine. But his absolute conviction and his brilliance at, as our, our friend uh, Matt would say, his brilliance at systems comes through he figures out a way that it can work and if it doesn't work the first time he tweaks it the coolest thing i was sitting with my wife we were watching uh what are they what does he call it the racket yeah he has all these fanciful names for his devices yeah it's kind of funny so rabbit chicken he has this rabbit chicken house where he's doing dual use i don't remember the numbers but laying hens and rabbits in the same space and the rabbit poo goes on the floor and the chickens just love that. And they, and they put wood chips on the bottom. And so it all turns into compost. It's like a three layer system. So you get rabbit meat and you get chicken eggs and you get compost for your garden, which you need in a, in a small area. And you're farming like vertically, like on the cube instead of on the square foot, you know, the, he's got the chicken, the rabbits above the chickens. And this is the system that he wants yeah, to it's like, put in the apartment. It's like carniv- carnivorous hydroponics. <laughs> but it's not factory farm. I mean, the, the, the rabbits are finished out on the grass. You know, they're, the bunnies are hopping around in the grass. It, it's, not, uh, it's not Tyson chicken. No, no. Where they de-beak the chickens. and uh, uh, Beneath all of his ideas, and Greg Judy, and Alan Nation, and so many so many Jim Garrish and so many of these people is that ultimately all farmers are soil farmers. And if they don't focus on creating soil, they're destroying. And he believes he knows that to build soil, you can't do the monoculture thing. You need biological diversity. The diversity word has been so ruined. I can't even talk about it. I don't even want to, it just like catches in my throat. I cannot even utter it anymore, Carl. So if you were in a rainforest, there would be thousands of species per acre, maybe. And on Salatin's farm or in a Salatin style homestead, there's still not going to be that many thousands, but they're going to be these representative types. He's going to have, you're going to have a ruminant animal. It's going to be something that chews its cud. You're going to have a cow. You're going to have a sheep. You're going to have a goat. Then you're going to have, you you want an animal with a crop, a gizzard. You're going to have some sort of a bird, turkeys, chickens. And then you need the omnivore. 
you're going to have a pig in addition to the people. The ruminant does not have a very efficient gut. And that ends up working out real nice when you start looking at cow patties and pastures. The kinds of things that the cow doesn't want to eat or can't turn into protein or usable calories, the chicken can. And then the cat, then the, the omnivore, the pig, can use so much of the waste from the farm, like spoiled milk and kitchen scraps and so on, that you end up having, because, because you have those three different gut types, you're able to cover most of your ecological you know, bases. So he, he just has to figure out how to do it on a small scale. Yeah, and the digestive systems are the way that, so if you think about it, so Alan Savory talked about solar dollars. Uh, if you look out in your your yard, the sun is falling on your yard. I suppose you could cover it with solar panels, but you can't eat that. Or you can grow grass on it. You can grow plants on it. Well, you can't. You could go out and eat the grass, humans. You could go do that, but it would just go right through you. It would come out the other end just like it went in. You can't digest it. So the magic... It is, it's like magic. The magic of the solar power gets to you through those three digestive systems and it makes it into things that you can eat. It's pretty cool. It's very cool. So he, he, he's, I I can imagine that one of the main criticisms that people have about what he does is that, well, one, uh, you inherited that land. You didn't have to buy it. And he, he actually addresses that. He's like, yeah, that's right. So what, you know, now what are you going to do? You know? And then the other one is, um, you do this on big, on a huge scale. I only have five acres. And this book is an answer to, uh, to those people. Yeah. He starts off with, uh, talking about the benefits of just livestock stewardship, how it's good for you to be an animal caretaker. I like that. Yeah, I hope so. Cause I think I'm going to do it. I'm just checking to see if I'm allowed to have chickens in my current town. Mm. If you had a small backyard, you could do chickens. Uh, and so part of this book, it's Polyface Micro. So Polyface is, it's a weird name. I, I don't like his names, but it's the name of his farm. And so this is Polyface Micro. It's how to do what he does on a small scale. The farm of many faces, Carl. Did you see the logo yes. on the back of the book? See, it's a fish inside of a chicken, inside of a cow, inside of a tree. Ah, no, I didn't really think about it. Yeah, Riley pointed that out to me. I didn't catch that. Tinley Park officials are advancing uh, a proposal that would ease rules for residents who want to keep chickens in their backyards. That's gracious of them, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, current code permits live poultry in residential areas, so that's good, but not within 100 feet of a school, church, public street, or home, or, <laughs> other than the residence of the owner of the animals. So you have to have a lot that's uh, 200 feet wide, at least. Yeah. Yeah. So they don't want you growing food in town. No. For sanitary reasons or whatever, it's for the children, I'm sure. Whatever. Uh, it's they don't want to hear the rooster in the morning. Now, that guy can fire up a, a leaf blower right by your bedroom window Saturday morning at 0700, but you can't have a rooster, you know. Stupid. Yeah, so what that means is that, and and I think the laws in that town are pretty permissive as far as sub- suburbs go. There's not a lot like of it. places you can do this. Why? So it means you have to bring your food in from other places. It means that you have to be dependent on uh, the evil factory farms. When you have all this land that we've got... Ugh, it's frustrating to me. (laughs) We have lawns. I hate lawns. Lawns are the stupidest thing in the world. They're stupid in Oklahoma. They're, They're almost as stupid in Illinois. Lawns maybe not be stupid in England. Or Kentucky, or some place that has enough water. Because you have to put stuff... uh, You have to put stuff down on the grass to make it grow. And then you have to water it to make it grow. And then you have to cut it with a gas-powered mower, probably. 
why don't you just have a sheep? <laughs> Be too much responsibility, Carl. <sighs> yeah, gets in the way of, of uh, Fortnite. I like this first chapter. Uh, he talks about livestock stewardship. He talks about the nature of animals. Most people don't live around animals to to really know about this. Uh, cats and dogs don't count. They're weird. He talks about how these animals, he writes here, that these animals live entirely in the moment. They live completely in the moment. When a cow is in estrus, she doesn't care about relationships or getting in the mood. She doesn't care if the bull is handsome, and she certainly doesn't care if the bull helps in the kitchen. No, she'll take whatever mail with the right equipment gets to her first. Over and done, and now time to eat more clover. That's how he writes. Yeah, so for me, who has not grown up around all of this stuff, I mean, it, it, there are lots of sentences in here that make you think, that get you, I think, in the right mindset. Uh, animals, with rare exceptions, animals have an unconditional appreciation for their caretakers. The milk, the milk cow is always happy to see you. No matter the news, the weather, or if your spouse is upset with you, the chickens always run to see what you're putting in their feeder. Animals love and respond to routine. They despise and shy away from new things. So maybe you don't even wear a different hat. Uh, he says you should try to walk in your animal's shoes. Try to figure out what they would do. He he waxes to mystic here hmm. on page four. I have to remind myself that my first responsibility is honoring the pigness of the pig and the chickenness of the chicken. The pigness of the pig, the chickenness of the chicken. That's an important thing. Uh, these animals have natures. Uh, we have, I think, deceived ourselves into thinking that the human being has no nature, that you can be whatever you want to be, that if you say you're a unicorn, you in fact are a unicorn, and other people need to respect that you are a unicorn. Uh, no, the pig is a pig, and the chicken is a chicken, and they're going to chicken and pig. They're going to do what they do. They're going to do what they do. You stopped reading there before he wrote. Out what they do. Uh, you stopped reading before he wrote. Different animals have different needs and desires. Some, like rabbits, especially dislike loud noises. If you had ears that big, you wouldn't like them either. Like, I don't like them. Yeah, he, you know he. That, that's what the rabbitness of rabbits are. Is you know like their their form and their essence and uh, is all is all tied up in it together inextricably and he he understands that and you know we read all this stuff we read and we have all these words for what you know the kinds of views that he, that he's espousing here but he's just really closely tied to reality he looks at a cow and he sees that they have eyes on the side of their head and they can see 300 and almost 360 degrees around them and then figures out how to approach them when he's having to handle them based on where their eyes are and how they see things and how they process information. That's wonderful. And whether he has developed like a, a, a personal philosophy that he could uh, articulate about that, dealing with these cattle every day and getting kicked or stepped on or smashed against the corral wall and getting a rib broken would force you to develop that philosophy, whether you could, you know, articulate it or not. I, I, I really like that about this. Do you think Jean-Paul Sartre ever went to a farm? Not unless there was an animal there he thought was sexy. <laughs> uh, Physiognomy check. <laughs> There's a bad joke I could make about him. Uh, he also could see 330 degrees around. <laughs> That's true. That's true. I'm sorry, Jean-Paul, but I had to read your books, okay? Animals had a prohibition against sex with him. <laughs> Goodness. Listen to this. Although bees, ants, and pack rats stockpile, this book is about the common farm critters, and they have a distinctive philosophy. You take care of me, and I'll give myself for you. Oh. Yep. I think of Homer when I read this. So if, if you read Homer, and why haven't you if you haven't, whenever they eat meat, you should pay attention to how they do it. 
They don't have hamburgers that you get through a drive through window. They have to take the critter in. They make offerings to the gods. They kill the thing. And then they roast it and celebrate. In other words, yes, it's a living creature that you're killing to eat. You should realize that and honor it. That it, that and understand the magnitude of what you're doing. Your your eating, and this applies to you vegetarians too. Your eating requires the death of other living beings. So you you should realize that. Mm-hmm. It's easy to not realize that if you're living in an urban area and getting all your food from a supermarket. Yep. Like people who don't want to people who don't want to eat food that has faces. We have to make everything square. <laughs> So it looks like it was ejected from a factory and not from a living being. I'm sorry. It's, it's, it's Sartre barely had a face. Uh, <laughs> my wife had a conversation with someone this weekend that she was relating to me. Broiler chickens, and we're going to use the Salatin broiler shelter method, put them on the pasture, move them every day, all that stuff. This lady said, you're going you're gonna to butcher these chickens? She said, Charity said, yeah, I'm going yeah, to butcher them. She said, I, I, I'm not going to help you do that. I won't have any part of it. I won't eat them. Well, where do you think everything you eat comes from? Like, what are you doing? What, what's going on? You know, I mean, we've all kind of, not all, not everybody, but so many of us have run into that sort of an attitude. Like, just as long as, as long as she doesn't have to think about it, you know. She doesn't care. Meanwhile, well, we subcontract our we subcontract our right. violence to other people. All of it. I'm ready to take some of it back in house, Carl. But if you go into this with this philosophy that he has, where you look at the animal and you say, "I will take care of you," and then you give yourself, and then you take care of them as he would have you take care of them. He says in here that you have to do all their thinking for them. And that you have to think about their safety, their hygiene, their diet, everything for them. And if you do that, they end up having a good life. And a part of pigness, whether people like it or not, includes being cured for bacon. Yeah. So these chickens that we're going to raise, we're going to raise um, Cornish crosses, which is a kind of a weird bird. But they're going to be on pasture. And have the best possible Cornish cross chicken life just before they go to freezer camp. Well, you know, and then they get to ascend to the uh, hierarchy of being. Right, which is my colon when I eat them. When right. I eat them. It sounds like a joke, but they get to become human. Hmm. It's not a bad thing. No. I like the point on, on seven. I hadn't really thought about it, but of course it's right. If you care about such things, in all the Bible, there are no named animals. Not a one. Animals aren't named. We, you know, we went to uh, Greg Judy's school, and you go do pasture walks with him and go see his herd, his flirt. I don't know. He's got about a thousand head of animals on his place right now. There is only one that's named. That's not true. His guardian dogs are named. But of all the herbivores, there's one that's named. That's Grandma. He has a an old, old cow who has, I think she's had 20 or 21 calves. And I think she's like 19 years old. And uh, he said, you know, she's the only one they're going to retire. You know, she's got a place of honor. But the rest of them are... 426 or 318 or whatever. The naming is anthropomorphizing. They're not human. You can love them, but you have to realize what it is that you're loving. You're loving a yeah. a critter. I think that's important. Uh, I want to read at the bottom of page 7. I was going to read that little bit you did there about the donkeys and all the animals in the Bible. But... Uh, He says, while I believe animals are happier on pasture than in factory confinement houses, 
from their perspective, their situation is unchangeable. Animals can't imagine a different life. They don't read books or watch movies about different living situations. We can imagine it for the animal, and that's why we have to make the hard decisions. They don't know. Yeah. Uh, so even the ones that are in the factory, con- you know, confinement farming, while I don't want that for any of them, they don't know any better. That's some little bit, some little consolation about that. Yeah, but but what about the land? Won't this won't this hurt the land? Hmm. No. The notion that this is uh, thirteen. I don't know how far in this book we're going to get. The notion that animals hurt the landscape does not come from historically natural and wild ecosystems. It comes from the human history dominated with improperly managed domestic livestock. If you do it right, it makes the soil better yeah the topsoil in iowa in nebraska and in the great plains is so deep and so good because buffalo shit on it for a million years yeah yeah that so if i drive out if i drive out to see you and i drive through illinois missouri oklahoma That whole area used to be covered with buffalo. The natural state, if you're interested in nature, in preserving nature, you have to think, what was the natural state of that land? The natural state of that land was to have millions of buffalo on it. High-density rotational grazing. Clumped in groups. Yeah, clumped in groups because they had predators. Uh, Probably the Plains Indians (laughs) were their predators, mostly. The job of the predator is actually to the benefit of the herd because you're plucking off the sick and the weak. You're plucking off the bad genetics and eating them, and you're making the rest of the herd healthier. So you're clumping them together so they eat the hell out of that plot of land, and then they move, and then that plot of land regrows. They clip off the vegetation. They stomp what's left of it down and then poop on it. So they end up sequestering that carbon in the cellulose and those plants in the ground and making compost right. in place. They go to water the creek, drink, 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 and then go back out in the pasture to graze and, you know, pee, depending, you know, whether you're a cow or a buffalo, somewhere between 10 to 40 gallons of that creek water out on the pasture every day. It's perfect. Yeah. Well, we killed all the buffalo to get rid of the Plains Indians. And so it's not in its natural state anymore. Yeah. And the answer isn't to repopulate it with buffalo. It's gone. And we've got all these people to feed for now. But we can re- we can replicate that by, you know, high-density grazing of, of these, these animals. Charity and I had a pond built for us. Uh, there was a pitiful little pond there that the beavers had destroyed and we had it all cleaned up and fixed and expanded and end up just when you get done having a pond built and the bulldozer leaves, it's a big old scar. The subsoil is brought to the surface. The topsoil topsoil won't pack well enough to make a dam that holds water. So they have to get rid, they have to scoop the topsoil away and put that somewhere. And then, uh, you know, they take a big damn hole and just denude all, all everything, you know, and it's, you know, here the subsoil is clay and they bring that clay to the surface and make a dam out of it. Anyway, Greg Judy told me, you just paid a whole lot of money to get that dirt out of that hole. You don't want it back in that hole. You need to roll hay out on that, all that exposed uh, soil so that it won't erode and that mud wash back down in that hole. So we got out and we rolled out hay, um, 10 round bales, and spread it with a pitchfork all the way down to the very bottom of this hole. I don't have any cows to stomp on it and poop on it. We had a big old, big old windy day come through here with 25 mile an hour wind, straight line, all day with gusts of 40. Blew a lot of my hay off, Carl, because I didn't have cows to stomp on it and put, uh, and poop on it. We got back out there, spread out again, and then it rained and snowed on it and stuck it down a little bit better. I'm glad we've got that pond, but until I get a bunch of cows around that thing to poop on it and stomp on that hay, 
and then roll out some more hay on it. It's just, it's just going to be a muddy scar for many, many years. You know this when you go through a housing addition and see a new home, they have to roll out sod. They expose, expose the subsoil and it's useless for growing things. They have to roll out, put some, haul in some topsoil well, and, it, and it, then roll sod out on it. it. So we have a critter that I think it's coming back this summer. I'm not really sure. The the 17 year locust mm. cicada, uh, which is one of those critters that we're supposed to eat in this new future. People will roast them. I, I don't want to do it, but it's not in any of the new subdivisions. It's not in any of the new areas mm. because they live most of their life in the soil. It's this fascinating bug that, that comes up every 17 years and uh, all they, they can, I don't think they can even eat. All they can do is yeah, mate. they don't have mouth parts. Plant their eggs and die and you just walk and crunch them. Like back, what, the first town I lived in is over by Indiana and it's got more, it's more forested and it sounds like chainsaws the whole summer when these things are out. It's unbelievably loud. These incredible creature, these big, like two and a half inch red eyed bugs. They bump into you. They can't bite you. They can't sting you. They're just kind of weird. But, you know, you plow the land, they're all dead. Turn the soil over to make houses, they're all dead. You you are killing the soil that you're living on. Which, uh, it's kind of sad. I feel bad for the bugs. Yeah. Yeah, I do too. Yeah, so his chapter, The Animal Why, outlines a lot of these whys. You know, why Why use the animals? Page 16, under number three, manure. <laughs> he says, soybeans are fine until you run out of fertility. Today, soybeans are still pulling from centuries of manure accumulation. Yeah. yeah he says, if cows were as efficient as soybeans, we'd have run out of beef centuries ago. Of course, cows are inefficient, but that's what enables them to put en- enough back to build soil. And he says, agronomists might disagree, but in my view, carbon is the most important component of soil fertility. Uh, I think that's right. And it's more important than the nitrogen. Without the, without the carbon, the soil won't hold the nitrogen. You know, everybody knows more, you know, on the internet, you know, they were telling me, oh, you know, you don't want to mulch. Uh, not, you know, some people were telling me, oh, you don't want to mulch these trees with these wood chips because it's a nitrogen sink. You know, any fertilizer that you put on those trees will be taken up by the wood chips and then composted and won't be available to the roots of the tr- of the tree. So if you listen to the agronomist, they would tell you to rake all of the grass away from the tree, pretty much denude the soil all the way out to the drip line of the tree. So that when you apply nutrients, it goes straight to the roots of the tree. Well, that's short. That's short sighted. That's absolutely ridiculous. Now it's not, if you're trying to get a crop to come in this fall, but if you're worried about one in seven falls or 10 or 40, I was talking to Uncle Roy about this stuff the other day. And he says, well, you know, we, we, we're still slash and burn agriculture. That's what he said. I think that's right. You know, the peoples of South America will, you know, chop down some rainforest to burn it and plant yams or whatever the f- whatever manioc root or whatever the hell it is they plant. And then when it won't grow anymore, they just move on and slash another piece. Well, for them, that's a couple of seasons. And for us, maybe it's several decades, but it's, it's the same. He's right. I was driving back. Uh, I've been doing a lot of driving and it's mostly farm country. And I was looking at the cornfields and it's a weird thing that you, you drive past a cornfield in October. There's nothing green in mm-hmm. it. There's nothing green in it. If, if you plant a garden, you know there are seeds everywhere. There's a seed bank. Things will pop up. If it is fertile, things will pop up. It'll pop up all year long till winter. And you're always pulling some pioneer plant out of there. How could you have a cornfield with nothing green in it? Because it's not fertile. It's not a living ecosystem. There's something wrong with that cornfield. Yeah. 
it will grow corn when you plant the corn and you put all of that fertilizer in it. But it doesn't grow things naturally. It, it looks like Mordor. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty weird. In the Animal Why, Chapter 2, he makes an economic argument here about why, why do it this way. His margins are much higher. He doesn't have giant tractors. He doesn't feed a bunch of hay. He doesn't buy nitrogen. His margins are higher. So there's the economic. That's basically the economic um, argument. Upcycle waste streams, he says. And this is really his idea of uh, you know, using these different animals to, to, to use everything. I mean, he he doesn't buy fence posts either. He he uses all cedar or honey or locust, you know, post off of his off of his property. Uh, he he leaves nothing undone. Most of his outbuildings are all mobile. And so if he needs to, if he doesn't like where something is, he doesn't have to tear it down. He just hooks a chain on it and drags it somewhere else. You know, so he's very very frugal. And chapter three is about manure, which is really about not chapter three. Uh, section three here is about. You know, finding your own nitrogen uh, for is about having the animals do as much work as they is for you as possible. And you know, he loves to have a chicken, you know, agitate litter, agitate mulch or wood chips. He loves to have a pig root through wood chips and aerate his uh, compost for him. He wants the animals to do as much of the work as possible. Boy, that's smart. Very smart. Well, if you think about it, it's the way a forest works. That's yeah. the way a prairie works, just on a smaller scale. Uh, nobody has to maintain the prairie, at least in the old days, nobody did. Yeah. It maintained itself. He likes to do uh, food storage on the hoof. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you kill one, eat one, and uh, You don't have good. to refrigerate it if it's walking around. Yeah. Yeah, I thought that was interesting. Like the the popularity of chickens as as the bird that we typically farm and eat, you know, rather than quail or something, because a chicken is one meal. Yeah, of course. My wife tells stories of her grandmother. You know, it's time for dinner. It's time for dinner. She got and get a chicken and ring its neck and pluck it and bring it in and there's your dinner. That's the way they used to live. Yeah. Now we have Tyson do it for us and wrap it in plastic. Beef cattle is pretty new. Beef doesn't lend itself to uh, smoking and, and curing like pork does. And uh, as a result, most cattle were really for milking. And, you know, your beef your beef would be from young steers that weren't suitable for milking or culls. You know, you can read about in the 1800s, people eating longhorns. They're tough, it's sh- shitty, wild animals, basically. And, um, you know, the idea that we have that these beef breeds now is is really pretty new. Uh, because, it, because it doesn't cure, there wasn't an economic demand for them. Because you would have to eat a whole cow. That's why they would kill the fatted calf. So right. it wasn't a full cow, it was a calf. Not serving size. Oh, personal nutrition, Carl. Right. You need refrigeration to have large scale, to have large scale beef consumption. Yeah. Then he talks about personal nutrition, emotional conviviality. The personal nutrition thing is big for me. We'll talk about that some more here later. It's an hour and six minutes in. We're on chapter three, page 24 of 399 (laughs) pages. Yeah, pitfalls. I mean, we can just go quickly here, I think, through some of this and then still talk about some interesting things. You don't want the animals to get out. You know, it's you don't want to scrimp on the infrastructure before you get the animals. You don't want them to get out. You want to make sure you've got water. You want to make sure that you have good genetics, that you're not buying somebody else's rangy ass cull animals. Um, And you don't want exotic genetics either. You know, you don't want a bunch of weird breeds. Don't buy the Scottish Highland cow because they're cute and you live in Amarillo. It's too hot. Yeah. Avoid the pet mentality. Make sure they get a good diet. Yeah, he he, he spells all this out. I love it. Strategic considerations. Chapter four, Carl. This is one of them that was most helpful for me. On page 45, he says, 
in all caps. Do not order broiler chicks until you have your processing situation settled. That means personnel, infrastructure, and final storage. He talks about that some more in other places. In Pasture to Poultry Profits, he talks about that too. The Cornish Cross chicken takes eight weeks to maturity. He says, have the brooder pen built, the broiler shelters built, have all your processing equipment, know what day you're going to do it, who you're going to do it with, where you're going to put the birds after they're dead. He also says, buy all of the feed that they will need for those eight weeks up front. You don't want your plucking machine to be back ordered. Now you have 75 birds to pluck by hand, which would take an army of people two days. You don't want a bunch of six week old birds and you, you run out of feed and you can't get more, you know, and so on. That advice for me was worth the price of the book. These are the sorts of things that if, if you are thinking of doing this sort of thing, you need somebody to tell you. Yeah. Because you think, oh, I, I'll get it. Shh, eight weeks is fast, man. Those little chicks show up and you're cutting their heads off, cutting their throats. Eight weeks later, I mean, you know, we've got laundry lays he around here. It's that about long. as fast as a radish. Yeah, that's what he said. There's another consequence of this. It's just really interesting. So you say, self, I'm going to raise 300 broiler chickens. Well, they need about 12 pounds of feed each, so that's 3,600, or, uh, 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 yeah, 3,600 pounds of feed. Go down to Stillwater Milling down here and go order it. It's 23 cents a pound. I got my boiler shelter built. I got my stuff. I got everything. I got the shrink, the shrink plastic bags to put them in when we get them butchered, and you dip them in hot water, and it seals up. You know exactly what your cost is before you put the chicks under the heat lamp. That is that is the ideal business situation. I have never had a business where I knew <laughs> my costs before, uh, before I even turned the tap. That is unbelievable. Now, you don't know your revenue, right? Like all the chicks could die. <laughs> you might, you know, who knows, right? I mean, you could have losses, but you do know all your costs which is the cost of the chicken. It's moving them every day. You can estimate that very closely. That is that is a special business opportunity. You know, I was talking to my daughters about this. I said, you know, what if you've got, your old man's got some land, I was telling him, and let's say you've got 10 grand. We could walk that backwards and figure out how many boiler chicks you could operate on from your 10 grand. And you almost can't go bankrupt. You might not make anything. But you just, you, I mean, you can raise, I don't know, something like 1,800 broiler chicks on 10 grand up front. And your risk for business venture is really minimal. The birds might all die. But you didn't have to borrow anything. You don't have open-ended yeah. expenses that could jump up. Like, there's not going to be vet bills yeah, for the fucking yeah. chickens, you know? Yeah, now you're talking about uh, doing this as a business. You got to figure out how many. I think in Oklahoma you can do 500. Oh, I think you can do more than that. You have to. I thought I looked it up, but you know, if you just did 50, you can make a smaller shelter. You don't need as much feed. You do 50, and you do it successfully. You've got a chicken every week of the year for your family. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I, at what five bucks a chicken? I I think that our all in cost no not our all in cost excuse me cost of the chick cost of the chick and the feed is going to run about six dollars. the The plucker and the scalder is not cheap. The broiler shelters aren't cheap, even though they are. You know yeah. they look inexpensive. They're they're dude. I mean. They're not cheap. Lumber. Yeah. So you're going to have about $6 in that particular bird, and then other costs that have to be amortized in there. But, yeah, so I was talking about running it as a business. Well, even if you've got 50, Carl, Carl, my academic friend, and you're going to do it for your home, 
that's a business with one customer. You know, if you're yeah. like, if you say, hey, uh, we're going to raise beeves for the family, you don't know what your costs are. You really don't. I mean, this is so, so much less risky than, you know, operating beef, for, even for even for the home scale. It's it's really, a, it's a closed system economically. It's really great. Well, it's not, it's not quite closed because you're bringing feed in from the outside. Well, under Sol- Salatin's, yes, but under Salatin's method, economically, once the chicks get there, you've already got the feed. It's closed at that point. You yeah. shouldn't be getting in your pocket again. Well, and you can think of the, the what is it, 23 cents a pound? You can yeah. think of the chicken feed that you're buying. You can think, what I'm really buying is compost for my garden. Yeah. Because you know, the, the feed that doesn't turn to the meat that you eat is going to be making your soil fertility higher, which means you can grow better carrots. Yeah, you do the pasture walk with uh, Mr. Judy. Every time he sees a cow pie, he points and he says, that's a dollar, that's a dollar, that's a dollar. <laughs> Can't you burn them if times get really tough? That's what I hear buffalo chips don't smoke your ribs over them it's gross doesn't work (laughs) somebody must have tried that yeah don't do that it's not good